Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Battlefield, Pennsylvania. Today we're filming on location at Waterford, Erie County, the former site of the French Fort Le Boeuf. In 1753, the Empire of New France began a full-scale military occupation of western Pennsylvania. To combat this threat, the colony of Virginia called upon a 21-year-old George Washington to travel to Fort Le Boeuf and confront the officer in command. Although he'd go on to do much bigger things later on in life, Washington nearly died twice on this expedition and laid important groundwork for the French and Indian War in years to come. I'm your host, Brady Kreitzer. Joining me today is Kevin Copper, Professor of History at Westmoreland County Community College, and Benjamin Scarf, Assistant Professor of History at Mercyhurst University. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. It's great to thank be you. here, Brady. Thanks. How did you first become interested in this time period? Sure, I've been drawn to the revolutionary generation in American history for a variety of reasons. In fact, there are too many to recount now. But the most important factor is how that generation used thought and action to fundamentally alter the course of Western civilization. Our protagonist today, George Washington, is often viewed as an old man with false teeth because that's how he's seen on our dollar bill. But we have to recognize that this individual was one of the greatest revolutionaries in world history. He defined power not by the ability to acquire it, but also by the ability to uh, give it up. And he did that twice in the Newburgh Conspiracy of 1783 and then later serving only two terms as president. Across the pond, Napoleon couldn't do that. The Corsican who crowned himself in exile once lamented, they wanted me to be Washington. Sadly, he had an unquenchable thirst for power, but the steadfastness of Washington, he was the steady hand that we needed in the very birth of our nation. And that story very much begins here in, in some ways. Benjamin, how about you? Well, that's an excellent answer, Kevin. Uh, the indispensable man, if you will, right, uh, Washington. I think on, 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 a, on a practical side, too, uh, because of the connections uh, to all Americans today, this era is so interesting because it, it can spark the imagination of the everyday person. And, and for historians uh, like us, this is an exciting period then to study because we can reach, uh, reach the general public and they're, and they're generally interested in it. Now, the world of the 18th century is one of imperial competition. France believes this area is theirs. So what's the circumstances of New France in, say, the 10 years leading up to 1753? It's an interesting time for, for New France, Brady. Um, one historian has referred to, uh, to New France at this point as a colony whose time was running out. Uh, on paper, New France was, was in fantastic position. They had uh, a fur trade that stretched 2,000 miles into the interior settlements, strong settlements that were 1,000 miles in the interior in places like the Illinois country in modern day Michigan. Um, so it looked very impressive. Um, but underneath that impressive expansion, uh, New France had serious problems. Uh, some estimates suggest that their fur trade, that the whole colony was based on, uh, 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 raised perhaps as little as 50,000 pounds per year, which was just enough to, uh, to uh, pay for the administration of the colony. Uh, in fact. Um, New France had by this point uh, reached a population that again by some estimates did not exceed much more than 40,000 people. Uh, so if they were going to defend this colony against uh, a British expansion they would need an outside uh, influx of, of support from France and the colony simply didn't economically bear that expense. Um, an alternative to that was France's, uh, New France's reliance on uh, the native allies who had strongly upheld uh, French power in the region for, for a century and a half. Uh, but by this period uh, that Fort LeBeouf is being constructed, again, by some estimates, uh, the population of the, the natives of the region had dropped to perhaps 20% uh, of their, their population of only a century before. Kevin, what was the circumstances surrounding the British in North America? Well, by this time, Great Britain is a maritime power in the Atlantic world. The 13 colonies stretch from Massachusetts all the way to Georgia. And there's population pressure, economic pressure, and political pressures to get across the mountains. The Ohio country was the strategic prize, that if you looked at a map of this region from across the pond in Europe, you could easily tell that whoever controlled the 981 mile Ohio River literally had the key to the continent. Also, while we're in Pennsylvania, this was such a diverse colony compared, uh, say, to our New England counterparts, is that we had Germans and, and Scots and uh, some Irish coming into this area, is that these people were from a displaced class in Europe. 
they sought land, they sought for the preservation of their families, and there was just a great amount of pressure that was building east of the Appalachian Mountains. Who were the Iroquois Confederacy and what role did they play in this region? The Iroquois Confederacy was the powerhouse in the Northeast during this period. They were founded approximately in 1451 and they were made up of six different tribes, although the last tribe did not join until 1722. They were made up of the Seneca, Cayuga, Oneida, Onondaga, and Mohawk. Their official language with, with regard to governance was Mohawk. They had a sophisticated government that when translated had 117 articles. Many argue that that may have even influenced America's government. Uh, they were militaristic, expansionist, uh, a proud, warlike people with a tradition uh, that enabled them to expand beyond Iroquois and move into the Ohio country. They were involved in a very violent struggle known as the Beaver Wars, which took place from 1649 to 1701. And during that period, they had, in essence, nearly depopulated through conquest and adoption uh, many of the folks that were living in the Ohio country. Ben, how did the Iroquois view Western Pennsylvania in the 1750s? Yeah, um, well, building upon uh, what, what Kevin had to say, they, they, had, con they had conquered the region uh, during the previous century through, through a series of conflicts, uh, which left them very interested in controlling the region. But, but as uh, Kevin had also mentioned, they had suffered greatly uh, due to these conquests. They had been depopulated themselves uh, through this process. So they, they controlled the region. They saw themselves as the rightful rulers, if you want to use that word, of the region. But they, uh, they had difficulty actually controlling it, which left them, in many respects, reliant on alliances with the European powers to maintain that control. Um, at, this, at this point, the decade prior to the, the uh, 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 construction of Fort LeBeouf, the Iroquois were more closely allied with the British uh, than they were with the French. They had actually, uh, the French and the British had actually agreed at the, at the conclusion of the War of Austrian Succession uh, that, the, that the Iroquois were officially subjects of Great Britain, which we should, to be fair, did not mean that the Iroquois did not continue to develop relationships with the French, just this was the official situation. If we were to go back in time and be on the ground here in western Pennsylvania in, say, 1750, what would we see? What's life like here? Great question. Uh, oftentimes the idea of a Garden of Eden or a pristine wilderness is European fiction. Uh, this was a place where mothers taught their daughters how to farm, sons were taught by their fathers how to hunt, where grandmothers gave great advice. It was a place that by 1750 had over 110 Indian paths. There was an established infrastructure. Uh, these were people of faith that were living in their family, with their families, uh, in communities, uh, mixed farming and hunting. It would have been a beautiful place that had a natural abundance. Again, from a European standpoint, it needs to be developed. But I want to remind you that uh, this place did not need to be changed. The people that were here, uh, if you were to travel, you would hear children playing and, and people laughing. It, it would have been uh, certainly a, a wonderful place to be. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, from the native perspective, this, this place was developed from their perspective. It's the European perspective that saw it as a, as a wilderness um, and it very, very much was occupied and, and developed. It's a cultural construct mm -hmm. to look at the idea of wilderness. What, what is wild to one group is home to another. Mm -hmm. And certainly that was the case here. Uh, again, just the sound of, of children playing and uh, parents teaching children and instructing them, it would have been a wonderful place. Building off of that idea, how did Europeans view this? What did Britain think of the future of the Ohio country? How did France see the future of the Ohio country? Well, the, the French, as I mentioned before, were not profiting, profiting that much from their empire. So when they moved into this region, they, they certainly saw it as a lucrative uh, area, but it, but it certainly wasn't going to turn around their economic prospects, prospects overnight. So for the French, they saw it more as a long-term investment to seize the region, possibly profit in the long term, but more importantly for them, more in a geopolitical conflict, deny it to the British, deny it to the British. They, as one, again, one historian has pointed out, the French kind of saw things in a domino theory type effect, that if the British expanded, they weren't going to stop expanding. So the French wanted to, uh, to step in. Um, conversely, from the British point of view, uh, Ke uh, Kevin mentioned a little earlier about what their goals in the region were, but, but I would add to that, that there were significant elements in Britain that actually did not want to expand. We tend not to think about that. 
Um, but empire for Britain at the time is not what we think of as the famous British empire that you know, the sun never set on. This is a smaller empire, a maritime empire. Um, and there were significant elements in Britain that actually feared the westward expansion of its people, feared that it wouldn't be able to control them, or the depopulation of the east would, would ruin its productivity. So there, there's actually, Britain's at a moment where it's deciding what type of empire it wants to be at this very time. To build on Ben's comments, we have to recognize that the mercantilistic economies of 18th century Europe depended upon a favorable balance of trade. And that you could argue that the French and Indian War confirms that New France or France was lost, uh, but had already been well on the route to that prior to this, is that they weren't making money off of their colonies. So the European nations, specifically the Western imperial nations, needed to build through these um, uh, colonial experiments, they needed to build the home economy to better assert themselves in European affairs. And certainly by 1750, Britain had gained the upper hand in that. There are people who already exist in these colonies. How did the British consider these people? How did they view these people in terms of their larger imperial plans? Uh, well, the first thing I think we could probably agree on in this is it depended per colony. Each British colony dealt very independently at this point with each native, native tribe. We're, we're operating at a point prior to the British government actually creating an official office to deal with native people. So it was actually left to the colonies uh, individually. Um, so if you're talking about New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, very, very different responses. Um, Pennsylvania had developed a close relationship with the Iroquois. The, they had built upon the New York Covenant chain, um, and they saw the Iroquois as absolutely critical to the, the future of their colony. Um, as far as I'm aware, Virginia had not developed at this point any official relationship with the Iroquois. They would, but not, not at this point. To build on what Ben is saying, uh, it's, it's likely that the British saw the Iroquois as their instrument to Western expansion, certainly against the French allied Algonquin tribes. So that there was a great deal of respect for the warlike traditions of the Iroquois. Uh, and of course, that's a great testament that the Iroquois still reside in upstate New York. Yeah, and, and I guess to, to add to that, the fact that the Iroquois were included in the previous treaty that ended conflict with France, that's very rare. Natives are almost never mentioned in European diplomatic treaties, but the Iroquois are. And I think that's a testament to their critical importance uh, to imperial en enterprise. Now, to get more specific about the term French, uh, we have a new governor general taking over uh, in the early 1750s, the Marquis Duquesne. Who is he and what sort of new policy does he bring with him? Well, Marquis Duquesne is given a very difficult job in the early 1750s. He's appointed in 1751. Uh, he arrives in, in, in Canada, New France, in 1752, and he has to do three things. He has to ensure the territoriality of New France in the Ohio country. He has to maintain favorable relationships with the tribes there via trade. And lastly, he has to keep the English out. So as a consequence, his idea is to build a line of fortifications known as a communication to connect the French holdings in Quebec to New Orleans. And clearly the Ohio River and the forks of the Ohio uh, was the spot that he chose. We're just a few steps away from French Creek right now. Uh, how were waterways viewed by European powers at this time? All right, well, waterways were the critical uh, uh, highways for moving people and goods. Roads uh, were very difficult to build uh, with unpredictable weather. Um, roads were, were, were a challenge. But even then, waterways were not as reliable as, of course, European armies and, and, and societies would have liked. Rivers were broader than they are today, shallower. They froze more frequently in the winters, dried up in the summers. Um, so they, even, even with them being ideal, that, uh, or the most ideal uh, avenues for travel, they, they were not um, all that reliable. In the 18th century, there are only two means of transportation in North America, and that is the waterways and the footpaths or Indian trails that have been constructed. You have to recognize that whichever colony or whichever country controlled the waterways controlled the future and destiny of the region. It would have been, as Ben pointed out, uh, very harsh traveling. Uh, countless primary sources talk about the rivers being frozen and the people on expeditions having to wait in, until they uh, melt. So it would have been a difficult and rough go for many of these early travelers. Both of these empires, London, Paris, Versailles, look at a map of Pennsylvania, what will be Pennsylvania, and they see a place called the Ohio country. Why specifically were they so interested in this place? 
Uh, well, from the French perspective, as mentioned before, they, they saw this in geopolitical terms, wanting to block the expansion of the, uh, the British, uh, the English. Um, but they also, interestingly, had, had already possessed a pre-existing water route further west, um, utilizing the Great Lakes further west, which, of course, didn't freeze as quickly as rivers or dry, certainly not dry up in the summers. Uh, but what actually interestingly began to happen in 1747 is the, the Western natives in the Illinois country had actually begun to stir up trouble against the French. And the French blamed the English for stirring this trouble up. Um, and so their, their, their supply lines uh, that they had relied on for so long had begun to be threatened. Um, so when they shift their focus to where we're at now, this was an alternate route for them, one to secure their Western trade in the event that their pre-existing uh, routes uh, ever were, were broken or shattered. For the English, you have to recognize, Brady, that there is not a clod of soil in Europe that isn't owned by someone. And the Crusades had failed, so Europe was not able to expand east. Can you imagine what it would have been like to be a colonial and to look out at those Appalachian Mountains and just think of the endless opportunities in land speculation? So in 1747, a company was formed known as the Ohio Company, and they looked to repopulate this region with the king's white subjects so they could engage in European style agriculture. So just imagine this, this place population and their opportunity uh, to look at that soil. To them, it did look vacant and to them, it needed to be developed. In 1753, the French take the first step and it's a bold step. What do they do? Uh, in 1753, the French uh, sent an expedition into uh, uh, the region of Northwestern Pennsylvania uh, with the plan to seize the, uh, what, what was oftentimes referred to as the Forks of the Ohio, well, by the English, referred to as the Forks of the Ohio, um, and therefore uh, bar the English from the region. So they, they began that process by landing about 20 miles north of us uh, at uh, Presque Isle and, and beginning the construction of a fortification that would create this communication, as Kevin called it, or, or be part of the communication. And they followed that up by, by building the second fortification here, Fort LaBeouf, and of course uh, a, a third at uh, uh, Fort Michaud. You have to recognize that in 1749, the French set a desperate expedition under Céloron de Blaville. And what he had concluded was that New France was losing the Ohio country, that they needed to act immediately, that the Indian allies had been swayed to the side of the British because the British offered superior trade goods at a lower cost, cost and in higher quantities. So uh, that 1753 expedition is in many ways an act of desperation. The, the French needed to be here or else they were going to be overrun by the English. Now on the English side, the colony that steps forward to deal with this is Virginia. Why them? Why not Pennsylvania? <laughs> well, Pennsylvania had a very different uh, situation than, than Virginia at the time. Pennsylvania as a proprietary colony uh, was being run by the Pens and a very powerful uh, group of, of uh, individuals uh, who worked with the, the proprietors to secure land for themselves. And they, and they still had a lot of land in what's now eastern Pennsylvania or really northeastern Pennsylvania that they were really focused on developing and in, in, in acquiring from the natives and developing. They were certainly interested in, in the Ohio country. They claimed it within their colonial boundaries, but they were in many respects preoccupied. Um, some people would point to the Quaker pacifism as uh, explaining the Pennsylvania lack of initiative in this region, but I think it has a lot more to do with their preoccupation with, with other regions at the time. They're, they're in a conflict with the colony of Connecticut, for example, in, in the Wyoming Valley, uh, fighting actual conflicts with Connecticut settlers. So they're, they're very preoccupied. Uh, Virginia is much more organized. Um, it doesn't have as, conf uh, as, as many factions within its government that are fighting amongst one another. It's much more unified and can direct its interests more. And as Kevin pointed out, that's really manifested through the creation of this, this Ohio company that will, that will actually act uh, here, here in this, this region of the state. With Virginia leading the way, the governor of Virginia, Robert Dinwiddie, chooses a relative unknown quantity, George Washington, 21 years old. Why was that decision so easy for him? The George Washington of 1753 isn't the individual that we see at Mount Rushmore. This is a person who is 6'3", about 175 pounds. Uh, he was an outdoorsman, uh, a surveyor, uh, an avid sturgeon fisherman, uh, a fox hunter. He was recognized as among the best horsemen in Virginia. Although he was untested as a diplomat, he was tested as an individual 
He lost his father at the age of 11. He uh, was already writing down the rules of civility by the age of 14, trying to present himself as a member of the gentry. Uh, by the age of 20, he had lost his older half-brother, Lawrence, and inherited one of the finest estates at Mount Vernon. I think that George Washington was the right man at the right time for this job, and he demonstrated that he was going to complete the mission or die trying. What was his mission? Well, his mission uh, was to travel to, to this region to uh, uh, deliver a message to the French commandant from uh, the governor of Virginia, in, uh, informing them that they were encroaching on Virginian and then therefore by default British, uh, British territory, and of course request them very, very nicely to, to depart. New France spends a lot of money fortifying this place. Did anybody think that Washington would actually get them to leave? This is the diplomacy before the war. This is the formal uh, agreements that are handed between individual nations before conflicts begin. Uh, so Washington is treated as an emissary from the colony of Virginia, serving at the behest of the British Crown, and he's treated very well throughout this mission. So before the guns begin to fire, there has to be a formal exchange in diplomacy. And, and of course, had the French actually departed, which they really had no intention of doing, uh, the Virginians would have accomplished what they had, what they wanted. They could also claim that they didn't start the war. Whenever they're talking back in Europe, it's that uh, both sides are arguing that the other had encroached upon their territory and that they had rightfully and justfully asked them to leave. Washington is not alone on this mission. Who's with him? One of the best parts about the mission is the study of the people that he went with. Uh, he has an interesting individual, ultimately he's mainly traveling with six, uh, but he has an interesting individual named Christopher Gist, who was a surveyor from Baltimore, decades older than George Washington. He had traveled to the Ohio country on a number of occasions and was familiar with the area. Because of the linguistic diversity of the Ohio country, Washington needed two interpreters, one named John Davidson, who would be able to understand Indian languages, and another man named Jacob von Braum, who was a fencing instructor, who had somewhat of a command of the French language, if you're familiar with what happens the following spring at Great Meadows. Uh, so he needs to have four servants, who he calls servitors, in addition to his guide and, and uh, his interpreters, also, he meets a number of Indians along the way, uh, mainly Iroquoian peoples who helped to lead him uh, on the Venango Trail. Traveling from Virginia to the Ohio country was a tall order. Did they know where to go? How did they travel? One of the greatest misnomers is that Washington was somehow wandering in the wilderness. Uh, there was a well-established infrastructure here. And although we can't compare it to modern infrastructure, it worked perfect. Individuals wearing moccasins could travel from place to place without any problem. So Washington first traveled along the Nemecolin path whenever he broke into western Pennsylvania on November 15th. Once he reaches the forks of the Ohio, he goes to Logstown, and, which is now Ambridge, Pennsylvania, and from there he takes the Venango Trail. So his guide knew exactly where to go. That's not to say that they don't depart, uh, during the mission from these trade routes or from these traveling routes, but nonetheless, uh, the idea of him just wandering, uh, although it may make for great fiction, simply isn't real. In Washington's journal, he keeps a detailed journal of the expedition. He writes extensively about arriving at the forks of the Ohio or Pittsburgh. He said it would be a good place for a fort. Why? It, it commands uh, the three major waterways of the region, the Monongahela, which at the time the Virginians still hoped connected uh, to Virginia, which they later found out did not, um, well, not, not, not in a uh, useful way, um, but they still at this point believe that, that they would somehow be able to link up with, uh, with the Monongahela and, of course, the Allegheny River uh, northwards into this region here in northwestern Pennsylvania, and then, of course, the real prize being the Ohio River um, uh, flowing westward. Um, so this, to him, commanded all of the critical geographic, you know, waterways, and we discussed the importance of waterways. This would be the commanding location. Uh, one interesting thing about it is he said it would be a great place for a fort, uh, but however, we know today, and even back then, that it's prone to flooding. Uh, so we can see that, That's right. uh, you know, in, in the modern era, that the forks of the Ohio is a place that is, is prone to that type and of... And the later forts would flood. <laughs> and later forts yeah. would flood. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. After Washington leaves Pittsburgh, uh, he arrives at Logstown. Uh, he's looking for a figure called the Half King. Who is that? All right, well, the, the position of the Half King um, 
is a little unclear as to what it exactly was uh, uh, designed to do, but what we generally believe is that the Half King was to serve as the representative of the Iroquois Confederacy in the Ohio country. Um, because although they had conquered the region, technically, and claimed it as their own, they had not populated it to any large degree, which had left the region open to settlement by other groups, refugee groups, such as the Lenape or the Shawnee. And so the Half King was designed to kind of exert Iroquois influence in the region over those groups. Of course, the degree to which they were able to do this is, again, up for debate and, and quite frankly, varied from time to time and, and due to whichever individual currently was the half king. Tana Cherison really represents the Ohio country in the following way, is that Ben had mentioned that there are refugee groups, Indians that were living east of the Appalachian Mountains that because of population pressure, uh, pressures and fraudulent land deeds have been forced across the mountains. Uh, Tana Cherison is part of that mix in this way, is that he's a Catawba Indian by birth, so, so he is not an Iroquois. He is captured as a child or a young man and raised by the Seneca. When he moves to the Ohio country, he is associated with the Mingo Indians who are Iroquoians living in the Ohio country that do not have an official say at the government's capital at Onondaga. So he could not be king, but really only a half king. Why was he so important for Washington's mission? Well, he, uh, uh, he had previously opposed French entry into the region. He had tra actually traveled up here as, before Washington and had told the French they were not welcome. Um, and of course, they, the French uh, did not leave. Uh, be because uh, uh, the Half King had, had staked his prestige on removing the French from the region, had he, had he not achieved this, he, he would have put himself in a more precarious situation with these refugee communities. Uh, so for him, the arrival of Washington in Virginia uh, was a useful tool to achieve uh, his, his previous goal of, of compelling the French to leave. In the instructions to Washington from Didwitty, uh, he is told that he must meet with Tana Cherison. So uh, if you, in order to understand the journal and the expedition, you must first understand the instructions. And Washington carries them out to a T. So Virginia had recognized Tana Cherison as their best bet among the Iroquoian people here to help not only in the expedition, but with the future of English interests. After leaving Logstown, you have a motley assortment of people moving with Washington. One of their destinations is Venango moving north. Why would they stop there and why is there such a profound European presence there? It's a critical juncture in the infrastructure of the Ohio country. That is where French Creek dumps into the Allegheny River. So the command of that strategic area was necessary for the success of the French endeavor and of course for future British endeavors in the region. And it, and it had been previously occupied by an Englishman, John Fraser, who had established a trading post there, and, and he'd only recently uh, withdrawn as the French moved down from this region. So, so it, it was a previously occupied location. In fact, the French use his house mm -hmm, whenever right. they begin to construct the fort there, right. Fort Machot. Adding insult to injury. And yes. they even put the French flag on top That's of right. it. That's right. One of the great things about Washington's journal is that he leaves these great detailed accounts one of them is with Philippe Jonquere, the Frenchman. Who is he and what happens between them? Sure, Philippe Thomas Jonquere was born in New France in 1701. He was a man that straddled both the native and newcomer worlds. By the age of 10, he was living at his father's trading post in Western New York. He had spent, by the time he meets Washington, three decades in the back country. He was the counterbalance to Tana Cherison. So he was the individual arguing to Indians that they needed to side with the French and that the future was with New France. And Tana Cherison was the counterbalance, arguing that the English are coming and indeed that they're here to stay. Washington and his men begin to move north. Again, their target is Fort Leboeuf. It's the southernmost fort they've built yet. Is there a reason they didn't expand further south at that point? The, the winter had, had set in, um, the, uh, as I understand it, and they had essentially buckled down for the winter, preparing, planning to continue their push in the spring, which of course set the stage for, uh, of course, the actions of the spring and summer of 1754. And their commander had died here in 1753, October. So because of the advanced season, he was unable, and, and the death of the commander, uh, they were unable to undertake the mission. If you would have been here in 1753, if you would have seen what Washington saw, what would have been here? It would have been uh, very noisy. 
<laughs> it would have been bustling with commerce and activity. Not unlike right now. Uh, yeah, yes. Is that yes. there would have been people coming in to trade. Uh, whatever Washington writes in his journal of the reconnaissance that he takes, he says that there are 100 French soldiers here, minus officers. He identifies that there are about 120 canoes uh, that have already been built. Uh, there would have been a, a stable here, uh, certainly for the horses. So this would have had the smells and, and the sounds of, of a bustling area. Uh, this is what it would have looked like, or it would have looked like an army on the eve of a major expedition. Yeah, the French weren't sitting back just enjoying the winter. They were actively preparing, as, as we mentioned, to, to continue on in the, in the spring. And often military expeditions during the period of the old regime uh, did not commence during the winter. So it's called winter quarters. So it would be very common because of inclement weather and difficulty in travel that these forces would have stayed here. Which of course is what makes Washington's voyage so unique that it occurred during the, the winter. If you would have been here in 1753 stationed at Fort Le Boeuf, would life have been comfortable? No. Not at all? No. What would have a daily life have been here? Boring. <laughs> it would have isolated. Hard work, poor rations. Um, yeah, think absence of, some of more family. Bad things. It yeah. would have been an absence of family. Everything that makes you feel comfortable. Yeah. yeah. Everything that makes you feel comfortable. Cold. Yeah, would you would be devoid of, of of life's pleasures here at Fort LaBeouf. That unless winter. officers may, would have had it slightly better. They oftentimes brought certain comforts. Still, from our modern perception, perception would not have been a great time, but certainly better than the enlisted man. One thing that would have plagued the soldiers here was the European construct of Indian savagery. Is that you could imagine that just looking into the woods, you wouldn't have known whether an enemy combatant was there. Uh, that if you were out hunting or even enjoying the countryside that you could be attacked in their mind at any time. So it would have also been a frightening place. Yeah, the, the Europeans made a, made a very firm distinction between wilderness and civilization. And for them, the, the, the forests were wilderness and anything that they constructed was civilization. And this fort stuck in the middle of the wilderness from their perception would have been a very clear demarcation, the fort being civilization and safety and the forest being being wilderness and danger for the average Frenchman. The, the average Canadian may have seen things very differently, sure. being much more comfortable with this environment, with this world. But, but for a Frenchman, I agree with Kevin, a very scary, scary place. When Washington arrives, how is he treated here? He is treated with the respect that is due to a diplomat. Uh, Saint-Pierre, who was the commander of Fort Le Boeuf, uh, is a man that was born in Montreal to a prominent family and decided to be like his father and follow a path into the military. Uh, this man was a gentleman, an entrepreneur, and a man who had spent a majority of his life uh, in the backcountry. So as a consequence, uh, this educated, well-versed man treated Washington during his three-day stay here very well. And if I might interject real fast, I, I, I suspect the two men had very similar backgrounds and may have and, and, and may have seen some similarities between one another. You know, um, we don't know, but but there you know there could have been an affinity. There. Both in Gist's journal and in Washington's journal, uh, they comment that they were treated very well. Now there was a lot of intrigue going on in the background. So as they are eating the best food that Fort LaBeouf has to offer uh, and uh, staying in the best accommodations that, 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 uh, that are available, uh, the reality is, is that in the background the French are trying to still sway the Iroquois allies of Washington to stay at the fort and to abandon the mission. Uh, so even as the highest frontier diplomacy is taking place, the backdrop is uh, surrounding with uh, intrigue and the attempt to lure alliances. And Washington is troubled by this. Uh, yes. It, it, he most certainly is. In fact, although he's 21, uh, he comments that this is one of the most trying episodes in his life uh, in the journal, is that Tana Cherison is being convinced, according to Washington, that he should stay with the French. And you can imagine what it would have been like for this young 21-year-old to assert himself in such a fashion to say to a man who had such power in the Ohio country, no, you are going to accompany me, 
for the rest of the expedition to the Forks of the Ohio. So he had to impress upon Tana Cherison and assert what we see as an early example of Washington's leadership. And of course, Washington was up to his own subterfuge as well, uh, as, as far as the, the dinner story goes. Uh, yeah. One of the greatest stories that comes out of the journal is when Washington has dinner with Jean Kerr at Fort Machot. Uh, Jean Kerr treats Washington to the finest wine that he has. And we have to recognize how difficult it would have been to get wine to this area. And Washington is steady. Washington is observant. Uh, he's not a teetotaler, uh, but he's not going to participate in a copious amount of drinking on a mission. In essence, he's at work. Uh, Jean Kerr does become inebriated, and he tells Washington that it is the absolute design of the French to take the forks of the Ohio River, and he says uh, in the journal that Jean Kerr said, by God, he would accomplish that. Uh, so to, to see Washington drinking French wine uh, moderately, uh, observing the French as they drink too much of it. Uh, he used it kind of as a way to interview them to find out their true intentions. What's the ultimate result of Washington's arrival here at Fort Leboeuf? Do they leave? How do they respond? The French do not leave. Um, they respond politely, but, but negatively, that, 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 they, uh, that they are not leaving. Um, and so Washington, I, I suppose in that sense, fails to convince the French. Um, although, again, I do not believe the Virginians or the British expected the French to, to willingly leave. Saint-Pierre says it very well in his letter that he writes back to Dinwiddie. Uh, I do not find myself obliged to obey your orders. So, so the French aren't leaving. In a lot of ways, I think this is a story of expectations. You've mentioned Washington traveling all this way, the French trying to sway the half king to their side. Did Washington really expect that they would leave? And was there any chance that Tanny Cherison would ever go to the French side? The record is silent on that. And of course, anyone that studies this period wish they had more primary sources, especially about the th thoughts that people had about these things. I think that Washington undertook the mission successfully. And that was indeed his goal. I don't know whether he pondered those things or, or, or really thought that they were going to leave. Again, as I mentioned earlier, the right man for the mission at the right time that would complete it uh, and even die trying. Yeah, and, and I'm not sure Tana Trisson was likely to have switched to the French because of the stake, as I mentioned before, he had in the English at this point. Um, personal conflicts with the French as well that he possessed uh, from, from previous to this point. Um, he himself was pretty firmly in the English camp. I mean, he's one of the few natives that will, will stay in the following years in the English camp when all other natives in the region uh, abandon the English and, and go to the French. Now, whether the other natives of the region would go along with him is still very much up, up, in, up in the air, but he as an individual is, is pretty firmly rooted in his, in his decision. Washington's letters delivered. He starts to head back south. He starts to head home but he goes with just himself and Gist. Where's the rest of his party? Trailing behind, Yeah, he, slowly. He was impatient. He wanted to complete the mission in a timely fashion. He recognizes that time is of the essence, that military operations are going to likely resume in the spring. So he needs to get the letter back to Dinwiddie as soon as possible. There's a very vivid illustration in the journals in which Washington describes that he sets out with a gun, the necessary papers dressed in uh, Indian walking garb and that he with Christopher Gist begin to travel south. So it is of the utmost important to, importance to the young Washington that he completes this as quickly as possible. And of course, as you said, to give Virginia and Britain time to respond in the spring if in, now that it is clear that they need to respond militarily. We have to remember that we're looking at a region that is on the eve of an incredible upheaval that the war that will be brought to this region will fundamentally transform the, transform the lives of every man, woman, and child and have impact across the pond in Europe. I can't say that Washington sensed that, but it was certainly on the horizon. George Washington and Christopher Gist are both moving south. How did they work together? Could you call them an odd couple? Yeah, yes. Yeah, yes. You, you can see it whenever you read their journals. 
uh, because they observe very different things. Uh, the number of Indian tribes that Washington discusses in the journal are numerous. Uh, Christopher Gist mentions very few. Uh, geographic locations for Gist are mentioned throughout and he's very precise. And the one reason I like Christopher Gist's journal is because he talks often about food. So apparently they were hungry throughout the expedition. So he recounts the number of deer that were killed, the number of bear that were killed. Uh, however, these two men are very similar. They're both surveyors. Uh, Gist comes from a, a prominent family, or at least he's well-born, if you will, from Baltimore. Uh, both of them saw their future in the West. In, in many respects, I, I would say they're an odd couple. Uh, Christopher Gist is many decades Washington senior, but at the same time, uh, Washington is his superior on the mission, and, and Gist finds himself answering to a man much younger than him, and then in his opinion, much less experienced. And that, and that must have been difficult for, uh, for Christopher Gist. Um, at the same time, Gist and Washington both came from prominent families, but Gist's family had fallen on hard times, whereas, of course, Washington's had not. Um, and so in many respects, Gist may have felt, um, you know, a, a, little, a little bit lacking in, in that regards compared to his younger companion. It's a falsehood to see Christopher Gist as a rough-hewn frontiersman. He certainly was, but he's from the city of Baltimore, and he is a trained surveyor. The connection that these two men have is that they're both working at the behest of the Ohio Company. So uh, I think they have great similarities. And as Ben pointed out, uh, it may have been difficult for Gist to accept some direction from Washington, but his status and position at that time uh, was far different than Washington's. The greatest commonality in these two men is that they knew the future was in the West. And of course, if I could add, if Gist is going to recover his position, it, it rests on the success of this expedition and the Ohio Company succeeding. So that may have uh, compelled him to work uh, better with Washington than he might otherwise have done. Now, whenever Washington leaves Fort Leibov, in many ways the historical narrative uh, drops off as far as importance, but a lot of the action is just starting. So tell us what happens at the village of Murdering Town. One of the greatest episodes of the journal takes place just south of Murdering Town, and it may have been called Murdering Town. The, the documentary evidence is uncertain. At this point, it's Washington and Gist traveling with an Indian guide who was nameless. And the Indian guide uh, tends to be traveling northeast, and Washington picks up on that, so he questions the individual. At, at one point, the, the Indian guide says that uh, they're near his hunting cabin, and that's where they can stay for the evening. But here's the action, Brady. Uh, all of a sudden, the guy begins to run in advance of the party. He turns about 10 paces off and fires point blank at George Washington. Uh, fortunately, the gun misfired. He immediately retreats to behind an area behind a tree and reloads. By this time, both Gist and Washington are able, in essence, to bear hug the would-be assassin. And this is a critical moment, and it shows something about the character of Washington, in that Christopher Gist says that this is the time to kill the individual, to, to punish him for the assassination attempt. Uh, and as Gist states in his journal, Washington would not suffer me to kill him. So the two men uh, tie him up for a period, and then as night begins, they force him to build a fire and release him. And then the two men have to travel south in the cover of darkness, fearful of the potential of an Indian war party catching up to them. Many people have ascribed this to the French, but there's no evidence to support it. So why would that assassin have wanted Washington dead? It's a great mystery. As historians, Ben and I are bound to retell factual information that we get from documentary evidence. And I've not come across any document to say that that individual was sent on behalf of the French. It makes for great fiction and good campfire stories, uh, but it's simply untrue. Yeah, and I think if you had to conjecture, I mean, we, we've discussed the, the, the various native groups in the region, and they're not all united in their view of preferring the English over the French. So this, this is quite possibly an individual that is hostile to English encroachment into their region. We, we just don't know, as Kevin pointed out. We don't, we don't have the, the, any documented evidence as to what his motives are. Yeah, murders have motives. And what would the motive be for the French to start the war? Yeah, the French were winning at this point. Why would they want to spark? That would ensure that there was going to be a British response in the Ohio country. It simply doesn't add up. When Washington and Gist finally reached the Allegheny River, 
they hope it'll be an easy crossing. In fact, if you look at the bridges in downtown Pittsburgh, one says Washington's crossing. Talk a little bit about his crossing and what really happened. Oh, if I can just start out, they, they, they expected it, I, I think as you mentioned, they expected it to be frozen. This is pretty normal for the period. The river's broader, shallower, they froze. Um, but of course they arrive and they find it quite the opposite. All they had with them was one doll axe. So on the canvas of your imagination, Brady, you have to picture the founder of our nation and Christopher Gist sharing an ax back and forth, somehow constructing a raft to try to get across the Allegheny River. Fortunately, Washington did not undertake maritime pursuits because the raft that they built, frankly, wasn't very good. And it broke apart as they were traveling across the waterway. Uh, Washington nearly drowned at, at this moment. Uh, the two men were able to swim to an island, which we believe is today's Hers Island, but we're uncertain whether that's the exact location. Uh, it was so cold that night that Gist mentions that uh, ice had formed over his hands and feet. Fortunately enough, to freeze the river so that the following morning they could cross. Washington nearly dies twice, but he does return home to Virginia. What's the response of the governor to his expedition? Well, the governor responds by acting quickly. Uh, he not only does he send the reports along with Washington's journal to, uh, to, to Britain, to Europe, where Washington will become known after this event, he will also request permission to, to move, and, which he, of course, will re receive in the affirmative. And so Dinwiddie, with Virginia and with limited British support, is going to begin to prepare um, uh, for, for action in the spring. And of course, Washington will be a big part of those plans. Uh, Washington has, I think Kevin pointed out, he has succeeded in the sense that he's completed his mission. He hasn't succeeded in the sense that he compelled the French to leave. But I think in Dinwiddie's eyes, Washington is a trustworthy individual, capable, as Kevin pointed out, but trustworthy because of both of their connections to the Ohio Company. Washington is a man Dinwiddie can trust, and he has plans for him uh, moving forward. It must have been a tense time, is that this region was on the eve of a war. And the Virginians knew it, the French knew it, and sadly the people that lived here in a country between those two nations knew it as well. And it's just such a compelling chapter in uh, America's revolutionary history, this first chapter in the French and Indian War. We're sitting today in Washington Park. We have a life-size statue of George Washington beside us. In your opinion, what is the ultimate legacy of this event? And do you think if it wasn't Washington, we'd even care about it? So yes and no. Had it been a man different than Washington that had undertaken this diplomatic uh, uh, voyage, who had gone on to uh, fade into the uh, shadows of history, would we be sitting in a shadow of a statue of that man? Probably not. Um, the, the fact that Washington moves on to bigger and better things, no doubt adds cachet to the events that occurred here uh, some 250 years ago. But at the same time, had this been somebody else other than Washington, and historians, we, we don't deal with hypotheticals, we try not to, but, but had it been somebody else, the war still would have happened. The continent would still have been reshaped. Um, and this would still be a very, very important event, a very, very important place uh, in the history of North America and of the United States. Ben and I are historians, so we don't delve in counterfactual history. The truth of the matter is, is that it wasn't a nobody who traveled here. It was George Washington. And this episode shows the traits and characteristics that will get this man through a terrible winter in 1777 at Valley Forge. A man who will set the precedence for our country as chief executive. A man who was the steady hand in Philadelphia in 87 when our country needed a constitution. This was important uh, because it happened. On that note, I'd like to thank our guests for joining us today. As always, if you have questions about today's episode or recommendations for future episodes, please visit our website at pcntv.com. For everyone here at Battlefield, Pennsylvania, I'm Brady Kreitzer saying so long. Mm -hmm.